Good morning, everyone. I'm Kathleen Hicks. I direct the International Security Program here at CSIS. Thank you for your patience as we were assembling ourselves this morning. Um, you're joining us this morning for the launch of our new report entitled Deterring Iran After the Nuclear Deal. Before we go further, I just want to give you a few safety reminders. Uh, you all came in from Rhode Island Avenue. If there's a fire alarm or something along those lines, there's exits out that direction. There's also exits in the back of the building, so just follow my signaling in an event like that. As all of you know, in July of 2015, the P5 plus 1 were able to conclude a deal uh, which we often call JICPOA, but it's the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action or the nuclear deal. Once that deal was concluded, it allowed, I think, more ability to attend to other issues that are ongoing with Iran. And from an international security program perspective, we felt it important to draw attention now to the range of other activities that Iran is undertaking. Um, and we did that consciously understanding there would be continued debate over the nuclear deal and its ultimate disposition. But these other issues aren't going away. Um, and so we wanted to collaborate with the foremost experts on Iran to speaking, uh, including not only our authors that I'll talk about in a second, but also speaking to a wide range of US government experts, foreign government officials, industry representatives, regional and functional security experts to talk about these other aspects of the Iran challenge set. Before I turn over to a video that we're going to introduce the discussion with and then the panel, I do want to recognize the authors that contributed to this report. We had um, a series of toolkit authors, uh, six in total, five in total, six in total. Um, on power projection, we had Farada, uh, Farida Farhai, sorry, from the University of Hawaii. On proxies, we had Matt McGinnis, who's joining us here today, from the American Enterprise Institute. On cyberspace, we had Mike Sulemeyer from the Belfer Center at Harvard. On maritime activities, we had Michael Connell from the Center for Naval Analysis. On missiles, we had CSIS's own Tom Carrico and Ian Williams. And on information warfare, we had Michael Eisenstadt from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And a very special thanks to Dr. John Alterman here on the stage, who directs the CSIS Middle East program and is our Brzezinski chair. Um, he made many contributions to the report throughout and kept those of us on the functional security side well aligned, we hope, with the regional perspective. <laughs> Also of note, this Iran project is part of a series that we are doing in the International Security Program on deterrence strategies and policies. Some of you may know yesterday we launched a major report on deterrence of Russia. We have in late April forthcoming a, um, a project that will release on uh, the China maritime and air challenges in the South and East China Sea. And we'll have a similar event to this uh, to launch that report. We do have copies of the Iran report available outside. We are live streaming this. This is an on the record event and we encourage conversation over social media. There is a hashtag up here on the screens. It's at, uh, excuse me, it's hashtag CSIS live. Um, this report was actually done out of pocket, so to speak. It was made possible by general support from CSIS, and there is no direct sponsorship that has contributed to its publication. And without further ado, I want to introduce the video um, that kind of summarizes where we went in the report, and then I'll turn it over to Melissa Dalton, who Han showed absolutely everything soup to nuts related to the report to introduce the panel. Thank you very much. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis has called Iran the biggest destabilizing force in the Middle East. Keen on ending its own relative isolation, Iran portrays its security posture as defensive, a type of self-reliant deterrence against adversaries bent on keeping it weak. This posture manifests in aggressive and subversive ways, and Iran has used a range of military and paramilitary tools that serve to destabilize the region. Although the JCPOA has curbed Tehran's nuclear program for the next 10 to 15 years, the United States and its allies have been unable to deter Iran's incremental extension of regional power. The Trump administration and Congress will need to evaluate and prioritize their objectives in Iran and in the Middle East to counter Iran's destabilizing activities. There are several policy pathways the Trump administration could take each presenting opportunities and risks for U.S. interests. 
One pathway for the administration could be to uphold the Iran nuclear deal while working to clarify any gray areas in implementation, including capping Iran's missile development. Some powerful factions in Iran would most certainly resist this effort, potentially undermining the influence of Iranian leaders willing to work with the United States, and would likely seek further concessions from the United States and its allies. A second pathway could be to disrupt the actions of the IRGC and undermine Iran's cyber activities through targeted military and financial operations, and by undercutting local support for IRGC activities. This pathway, however, could lead to an Iranian response including kinetic and cyber offensives against the United States and regional partners. A third pathway could be to challenge Iranian maritime aggression in Gulf waters by taking a more assertive stance in enforcing the rules of engagement for U.S. personnel in the Gulf. This pathway could risk escalation in the narrow Gulf waters of the Strait of Hormuz. A fourth pathway could focus solely on upholding the nuclear deal to ensure that it is not derailed by internal and external pressures in the U.S. or Iran. This pathway would likely lead to continuing Iranian provocations and non-nuclear capability development that may increase absent a response from the United States and its partners. Ultimately, the Trump administration and Congress must create a holistic strategy that accounts for a range of Iranian objectives and activities. This would include a commitment to uphold and strengthen the nuclear deal, working with allies and partners to step up counterterrorism efforts against Iranian proxies, sustaining financial pressure and incentivizing Iranian cooperation where possible, and countering Iranian activities along the spectrum of conventional and unconventional operations. highlighting some of the key findings and recommendations of CSIS's new report, Deterring Iran After the Nuclear Deal. I'm Melissa Dalton, Senior Fellow and Deputy Director of the International Security Program here at CSIS. Today I'm joined by a distinguished panel of current and former officials and experts. Together, we'll seek to unpack the dynamics of Iran's strategy and motivations, its military and paramilitary capability development, as well as the policy choices faced by the Trump administration and the U.S. Congress on Iran. Joining us via video teleconference, we have Lieutenant General Charles Brown, the Deputy Commander of U.S. Central Command. Prior to his current assignment, he served as the Commander, U.S. Air Force's Central Command. Lieutenant General Brown has served in several positions at the squadron and wing level. His notable staff tours include aide-de-camp to the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, Director of the Secretary of the Air Force and Chief of Staff Executive Action Group, and Deputy Director for Operations at U.S. Central Command. The general is a command pilot with more than 2,900 flying hours, including 120 combat hours. To my right is Dr. John Alterman. John is the senior vice president and holds the Brzezinski Chair in Global Security and Geostrategy and is director of the Middle East program at CSIS. Prior to joining CSIS in 2002, he served in several positions at the U.S. Department of State and as a legislative aide to Senator Moynihan. In addition to his work at CSIS, John often teaches Middle Eastern Studies at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and George Washington University. John received his AB from Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and his PhD in History from Harvard University. I'm grateful for John's contributions to our Deterring Iran report. Next, we have uh, Dr. Colin Call, who is an associate professor in the Security Studies Program at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. From October 2014 to January 2017, he was Deputy Assistant to the President and National Security Advisor to the Vice President and represented the Office of the Vice President as a standing member of the National Security Council Deputies Committee. From 2009 to 2011, Colin was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Defense for the Middle East at the Pentagon, where I had the good fortune to work for him. Colin received his BA in Political Science from the University of Michigan and his PhD in Political Science from Columbia University. And on the far right, we have Mr. Michael Singh, the Lane Swig Senior Fellow and Managing Director at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Mike was Senior Director for Middle East Affairs at the National Security Council in the George W. Bush Administration from 2005 to 2008. 
Previously, Mike served as Special Assistant to Secretaries of State Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell and at the U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv. Mike holds a BA from Princeton University and an MBA from Harvard University. Mike also just released a report on deterring Iran earlier this month, and I'm sure he'll share some of his insights uh, today. With this terrific group assembled, I'd first like to turn to Lieutenant General Brown, who has graciously joined us from, from CENTCOM, yes. to walk us through some of the operational considerations surrounding Iran. Thank you so much, General Brown. Um, first, I'd like you to, to address what challenges you view that Iran poses to U.S. military objectives in the region. Well, thanks, thanks a lot, Melissa, and uh, let me make sure you guys can hear me before I, uh, I keep going. If you give me a good thumbs up, good. Good to go, hey, sir. If, uh, it, all right, good. It, it's really a pleasure to join uh, join you. And I regret that I couldn't get to uh, D.C. to be part of the panel there on, on stage with the rest of the panelists. And uh, but it's a, it's an honor to to be with you. Um, you know, I think one of the areas when we start looking at our military objectives for uh, in Iran, you know, it, it does pose a quite a bit of a threat, and it's probably our longer term threat um, within the region uh, across the board, and one that we'll have to deal with uh, for an extended period of time. You know, as we look at the uh, the Jikpoa. Uh, the JICPOA does address the, the nuclear aspect of Iran um, in, in the near term, uh, but it's not the end-all uh, solution. Mm -hmm. It's the other things they do in the behavior that, uh, that concerns us uh, here because of their, their goal to be a re regional hegemon. Um, as we work in the region, uh, the areas that we, we focus on, particularly as you look at the operations uh, inherent resolve with Iraq and Syria, it's, it's Iran's influence uh, within um, uh, within uh, that that particular campaign, both in Syria and in Iraq, right now I, I would say there's a uh, we, we both have the same objective is the, the defeat of ISIS, um, but at some point those uh, uh, those goals and objectives will separate and then we'll be uh, back to where we have a little more of a, a confrontational uh, aspect, uh, particularly in in the land environment. Um, partly be also because of that of the paramilitary force that's there there within uh, uh, Iraq as well as uh, Lebanese Hezbollah. And the proxies that the Iran uses um, in, 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 in quite large numbers that that uh, that are now very well trained, very well equipped, uh, which can be a threat uh, in the long term for us uh, in, within the region. And then we also see their their cooperation with uh, uh, the Syrian government and and with Russia. And, and Russia is another player that uh, just complicates things uh, within the within the region when we start looking to uh, uh, to maintain some level of uh, stability. Um, we, we've also seen as Iran increases its own capabilities, it, it does export that capability, and I can talk more about that in maybe some of the follow-on conversations, but uh, you know, th their increasing capability just increases the capability of their proxies, uh, which creates a larger challenge not only for our, our military objectives, but also for our force protection for our, our, uh, our service members that are in harm's way. And the last piece I'd offer is uh, you know, the maritime. And uh, as many folks know, um, CENTCOM, Central Command has three of the world's major choke points. Uh, the Strait of Hormuz, Bab el and the Suez Canal. Uh, the Iran has an influence on the Strait of Hormuz, basically because it's right there on their uh, on their waters. Uh, but they've also here recently started to influence the Bab el Mandeb through their support to the Houthis in uh, um, in uh, in Yemen. And that by uh, by default also impacts the Suez Canal uh, because you won't, don't want to come through the Red Sea to the Bab el Mandeb. Um, if you can't get through there because of the threat, then you're probably not coming through the Suez. So that does concern us as well. So uh, overall, those, those are kind of the, the major challenges, the, the maritime being one of the bigger ones for the freedom of navigation and the flow of uh, world commerce. Thank you so much, General Brown. Um, could you next comment on what you believe to be the tra trajectory of Iran's military and paramilitary capability development? We just lost them. Okay. Great. Um, if so no, he, can, he can't. He can't. He can't. It's just there's too much to, to, to speak about. Um, hopefully we'll be able to, to reestablish the connection, but um, I think General Brown set us up pretty well um, from an operational perspective to begin a conversation in terms of the, the impact on the region, John. Um, could you, based on the work that we did in the study and then you know, any follow-on thinking that you've been doing in terms of recent developments, what you view as Iran's strategy and motivations in the region? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Melissa, and congratulations on getting the report out. One of the things that was so striking about General Brown's presentation is, is it talked about how defensive a posture the U.S. is in, and in fact, Iran is very much in a defensive posture as well. Iran often acts in confounding ways, so Iran, just to take a simple issue, 
Iran has been insisting have to drop sanctions against Iran as part of the nuclear deal. But Iran also fears dropping sanctions because they see dropping sanctions as a way to undermine Iran by undermining the, the leadership networks that are involved in smuggling to circumvent sanctions. And so dropping sanctions and opening up the Iranian economy is important, but it's a plot. And it's part of this broader strategy to undermine Iran. And see, even straightforward things with Iran often are not as straightforward once they go through an Iranian filter. Um, Iran has this deep sense of strategic isolation. It is surrounded by countries it sees as hostile. It deals with the United States presence in the Gulf, which it sees as a fundamentally hostile presence. And that sense of isolation is exacerbated by this belief in Iranian greatness that long precedes the, Iranian, the Islamic Republic. There's a sense that Iran's rightful place in the region is really to lead the region, and it's the United States and US hostility which is keeping Iran down. And that sort of mindset creates, I think, two really important paradoxes when you're talking about US strategy toward Iran. The first paradox is that Iran's feelings of isolation and vulnerability cause Iran to act aggressively, which in turn deepens Iran's isolation and vulnerability, which induces Iran to act more aggressively. So Iran gets trapped in this spiral where it acts in ways that, that exacerbate precisely the conditions it's trying to undermine. The other paradox, which is distinct but related, is that if the US is conciliatory toward Iran, that then reinforces Iran's negative behavior because it says, well, the negative behavior is what's getting the US to back down. But if the United States confronts Iran, that just increases Iranian resolve because it reinforces the narrative the US is a hostile power trying to undermine Iran. So it's one of these you know, heads I win, tails you lose situations. Whatever Iran does, it takes it, or many people in Iran take it as a sign to continue the objectionable behavior because it reinforces precisely the wrong instinct. I say this with a little bit of a caveat. Iran is a very complicated system with very complicated internal politics which are moving. There certainly are politicians who are, are trying to seize greater power in the system. But I think the general signals, there are always lots of people in Iran, and particularly the people in the military establishment, who take whatever they're doing as a symbol, as a sign to be more aggressive because they see that as getting Iran out of this trap of, of being vulnerable. Um, Iran quite strikingly doesn't see itself as an aggressor in the region. It doesn't see itself as an aggressor at all. Instead, it sees itself employing what the video, I think, accurately rely, uh, referred to as self-reliant deterrence. That Iran doesn't have outside powers to boost its deterrent capability. Iran has to use limited resources, a very small network of friends, virtually no countries in the world are genuine allies of Iran. And so it does what it can do on the cheap, and it uses proxy groups, and it uses Shia minorities in other countries, and it does what it can to demonstrate that it's not weak and vulnerable and everybody can't just walk over Iran. Um, their narrative of the JCPOA is not that because of sanctions they had to give up their nuclear program. Instead, that their narrative of the JCPOA is the world had to accept the legitimacy of the Iranian nuclear program. And the world has to accept that we're a regional power and deal with it. So rather than be a sign that, that Iran has to, to walk back its actions, in fact, Iranians at least talk about in the, in the Iranian system that it legitimized Iran, legitimized Iran's presence in a very important way. Um, they see what the US is talking about and, and what General Brown was talking about limiting Iran's proxy efforts and everything else as actually part of a long-standing US effort to make Iran more isolated and vulnerable, to take away all of Iran's allies and, and make Iran more subject to US power as, as a part of a broader US effort to, to undermine Iran. Of course, Iran's neighbors see this thing entirely differently. When Prime Minister Rabadi was in town last week, he talked about the very important need not to fall too closely under the sway of Iran while also not 
falling too closely under the sway of the United States. He's trying to, to balance. I think for other states, the GCC states, see a keen need to maintain US support because they see Iran as a regional hegemon, as an aggressor. They certainly talk to Iran. They know Iran's not going away. But to have Iran there, you need an external guarantor, just as the Gulf has had external security guarantors since the Portuguese were there in the 16th century. The desire in the Gulf for an external guarantor against Iran is really longstanding. It's going to be enduring. I don't think it's going away. Israel is a harder case, I think in part because Israel and Iran see something politically useful, each see something politically useful in their hostility. For Iran, being hostile to Israel is actually helpful, partly because it takes this Shia Persian power and makes it into a genuine Middle East power. Iran is really an oddball in the Middle East, but its hostility to Israel gives it a sort of popular currency, which would otherwise be very hard to maintain. Hostility to Israel represents a clear break with the policies of the Shah, who had a very different strategy toward Israel. And hostility to Israel gives the country a safe, fairly distant enemy. The odds that Israel will invade Iran are zero. That's the kind of enemy you want, one that's not going to be on your doorstep every day. I think that there's a, certain, there's a certain utility that Iranian politicians, Iranian leaders see in having enduring hostility to Israel. There's also, in the incredibly fractious politics of Israel, it's great there's, somebody, there's something everybody agrees on. They can't agree at all on what to do about the Palestinians. They all agree that Iran's a threat. And it reinforces the sense that I think a lot of Israelis have, they believe deep down, that Israel faces an existential threat, and the fact that Iran keeps talking about it reinforces to Israelis, we live in a dangerous world, and the Iranians are a reminder of just how dangerous this world is. I think for the Israeli military, a slightly different view, Iran represents a target that you have to consistently and quietly deter. So it gives a focus to Israeli deterrence, which not only keeps the Iranians at bay, but also Iranian proxies closer to Israel. Um, for all of these countries, the GCC states, Iraq, and Israel, US abandonment is probably a greater threat to them than direct threats from Iran. The more imminent threat is that the US is not going to care. And it seems to me that the targets of their strategies I don't think are in Tehran. I think the targets of their security strategies are really here. They're trying to help shape our debate to keep us there. The true task for us is how to persuade Iran that a different set of behaviors will produce a different set of outcomes. I don't think they think that yet. Thanks, John. Really helpful overview of the complex dynamics of navigating Iran and, and the region. Um, we were rejoined uh, by Lieutenant Colonel Brown. Thank you so much. Um, I, can you hear us well? We can see you. Yeah, I, I have you loud, loud and clear. And uh, I, I'll just say, yeah, I, I, was, I was just at the end of my answer for my first que the first question you had for me when I cut off. So uh, I think I addressed everything I wanted to on that uh, first question. Great, thank you so much. Um, if, if you have an opportunity to also address uh, what you believe the trajectory of Iran's military and paramilitary capability development is, uh, that'd be very helpful. Well, um, I will just tell you that over, over time it's been increasing. And uh, the, the things that we, uh, we look at are ballistic missile uh, capability, their uh, cru coastal cruise uh, defense missile uh, capability, cyber capability. Um, and, and then their, their support to proxies. Uh, when we look at uh, ballistic missiles, and that's probably their, their, uh, the, the weapon of choice, or at least it has the most influence in the region. I, I will tell you, having uh, been in the region a couple times uh, as the air component commander and the deputy air component commander and then being here at CENTCOM, uh, I've watched over time that, that capability increase. And it's one area that I think that the, uh, the regional nations actually all agree on uh, to include Israel, as uh, Mr. Altman kind of uh, alluded to, is that the ballistic missile threat is, is the thing that the, is most concerning and uh, kind of co co coalesces the, uh, the GCC nations uh, somewhat together. And, and what we've seen over time is the, in, in, in some cases, increasing range, but more so increasing accuracy uh, 
um, that the, over over time with those uh, uh, with their uh, with, with their theater ballistic missiles. The same uh, would apply on with the coastal uh, cruise defense missiles and anti-ship uh, uh, cruise missiles as well. Um, not only for what they use in the Strait of Hormuz, but uh, also what they've uh, started to export in other areas, uh, particularly uh, around the Bob and Land Depth, so, so that's a concern. For cyber, um, denial of service type of attacks, um, and we've seen that not, you know, not so much uh, uh, towards the United States, but within the region, uh, to different countries there within the region, so, that, so that's another area. But realizing that uh, that cyber is not necessarily bound by ge doesn't necessarily be bound by geographic uh, areas, and it can actually influence the United States as well. So that that's an area of of concern. And I've already kind of talked and addressed some of the maritime uh, uh, pieces uh, 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 previously uh, with uh, some of their uh, capabilities. Uh, I think the other area that we, um, if we're looking at uh, as well as their uh, uh, integrated air, air defense systems, you know, they recently bought some stuff from the from the Russians. Uh, SA-20s, and so that's some increasing capability as well. Um, that uh, you know, if we were ever to go to conflict, it, it would actually uh, um, uh, make it a harder target if, if that was the case. Uh, ideally, that's not not our goal. Um, and then the support, uh, as I said, the support to proxies. So as they increase their capability, it, it also it's an ability for them to increase uh, the export of that capability to different proxies so that so it can be used. And the, the last piece I would offer is uh, uh, information uh, uh, operation, information warfare. Um, they, they were actually, I would offer that they're probably better than we are at it in, in some aspects and uh, how they're able to, to uh, uh, influence uh, opinion within the region, uh, realizing they live in the region, uh, we don't, and uh, they're, 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 they do a pretty good job at that uh, as well. And so what we see for us is really, uh, as I address all that, and it's addressed in the paper as well, is, is how we compete in the gray zone. And, uh, and that's an area that we, we look at, uh, even though we, 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 as a, we talk about the JICPOA, it's the gray zone where we are today, and uh, realizing that I don't think we or the Armenians want to get to an open conflict, uh, but it's what we do underneath the, uh, I would say, underneath the radar that kind of keeps us, uh, uh, keeps us uh, a bit worried about uh, a miscalculation that might uh, pretend in the future. Very well said. Thank you for, for framing that. Um, Given the, the picture that you painted and, and also um, what, what John noted in terms of some of the regional dynamics, General, what do you believe are the key operational questions that should be considered in crafting a deterrent strategy for Iran? Well, well I think, uh, I mean, I, I really like John's comment about, uh, you know, what our partners in the region are, are trying to do to make sure there's a security guarantor there um, and how, how they uh, approach things. But I really look at how we how we compete in the gray zone, and uh, and it's not so much that we would have red lines, but you know how do you actually understand uh, um, influence within the region? Because you know Iran's in the region, well we're in the region, our partners want us in the region. So how do you balance that influence uh, within the region? So it's one is a strong deterrence posture, and uh, part of that for us is, uh, is is presence by having military presence within the region. Um, realizing that we've actually drawn down a bit since uh, um, you know, kind of a high water mark in two, 2012, 2013 time frame. Um, and uh, we have a, quite a bit of activity engaged, particularly in Iraq and Syria, and, and still engaged in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. But uh, presence uh, matters, and, uh, and it helps with our relationships with our partners in the region. So we can't, uh, serve, we can always serve capability to the region, but uh, our presence in the region and our posture in the region is important to how we, how we do that. Uh, we also have to have a, a targeted counter messaging campaign, and I think this is an area that uh, you know we've got to do better in our information operations and, and how we talk about what's important to the United States within the region, as well as with our partners um, uh, within the region in our activities. And sometimes it's not only what we say, but it's what we do. Um, and, and part of that is also how we build our our, uh, our uh, partner nations' capacity within the region. Um, and I think that's an area that, as I've watched the, the, uh, the region, um, particularly from the air side, because I'm, I'm an airman, uh, but you, you watch the capabilities, uh, our partners start to realize it's, it's not just about having the piece of equipment, it's also having the capabilities. It's not, it's the human capital, it's the training that goes with it, it's the logistics, it's, it's building that capacity that, that could be a deterrent, but also um, an assurance for, uh, for our partners within the region. <laughs> And then the last is uh, maybe some innovative approaches. And you know, when I say innovative, that means that we, there's some things that we haven't thought about that we probably could do. Um, but from a broader aspect, um, it, it, there, it, there's a whole government approach to this. And so uh, the military and, and Department of Defense and our, uh, our partner militaries have a capability, but it's how do we actually uh, 
take all of those together and look at the different uh, instruments of power and apply those to, uh, uh, to Iran um, and, and within the region to, uh, to provide the security and stability that we, we uh, desire. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, General Brown. Um, I'd like to turn a bit to, to the policy dimension, given the operational and regional dynamics that have been laid out both by General Brown and, and John this morning. Colin, if, if you were still sitting at, at the White House and advising the, the current president, uh, what priorities, <laughs> suspend disbelief, um, what, what would be the, the priorities that you would recommend the United States tackle on Iran policy? Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. Uh, it's a lovely facility, even if it's not a lovely day. Uh, so it's great to see you all uh, this morning. Thanks for coming out in the rain. Um, I mean, to state the obvious, I'm not likely to be back at the NSC anytime uh, soon. In fact, given my Twitter feed, I'm not likely to be allowed on the White House grounds uh, for at least the <laughs> next four years. Uh, but um, in, in, my, in the spirit of being the loyal opposition and trying to provide constructive uh, advice on an issue that I paid a lot of attention to uh, inside and outside of government, Look, I think the report gets a lot of the priorities basically right. I think that the chief priority has to be to keep the JCPOA on track. Even if one thinks it's an imperfect deal, it puts meaningful constraints on Iran's uh, nuclear program for the next uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, and I think keeping it on track means living up to our obligations under the agreement. I think we have to be especially mindful of that in the context of congressional legislation that's already uh, brewing uh, up on the Hill, which we can talk about uh, if people are interested. I also think it means keeping the Iranians honest to their commitments, but not doing it unilaterally, uh, that it, we have an obligation to work through the P5 plus one partners and the EU to make sure we're all on the same page. Because my experience is Iran responds most effectively to multilateral pressure uh, and incentives as opposed to unilateral pressure, especially vis-a-vis -vis the United States, where it, it allows them to, it, it, it incentivizes the worst aspects of their domestic politics. And you get into kind of the security dilemma that uh, John uh, pointed to. So that would be the first priority is to keep uh, the JCPOA on track. I'm gonna come back to that uh, in, a, in, a, in a second. Um, I, I also I want to echo something that General Brown said. I think it's really important that from a deterrent posture that we not only have the right, our own posture in the region, but continue to build our partner capabilities, especially in those areas, frankly, where, look, the Saudis don't need more F-15s to deal with Iran, but they do need more counterterrorism capabilities, more cyber capabilities, more maritime capabilities, more ballistic missile defense capabilities, and crucially, the GCC states need more interoperability among themselves and with us. This is something that CENTCOM's been working on for years and years, uh, going back uh, to some of the things that General Petraeus uh, and then General Mattis uh, uh, were engaged in uh, back when I was uh, at, at the Pentagon. Uh, so that's important, and I think I, we should be thinking creatively about how we can push back against Iran's destabilizing activities, their support for terrorism, their support for uh, 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 militancy, uh, and their conventional threats uh, to our forces and to our, our, our partners. But I think, crucially, we should do this with a holistic political strategy in mind, not just a military uh, strategy. That is, a lot of what we should be doing to push back against Iran in the non-nuclear domains should be to generate leverage to pursue a particular political or geopolitical outcome. And I have no idea what the political or geopolitical outcome that uh, this administration wants. Uh, I know that our partners in the region, uh, principally the Saudis, the Emiratis, and, and uh, the uh, Israelis want Iran to lose and their side of the, of, of the kind of bipolar division in the region to win. Uh, and we have an administration that likes to talk about winning. Uh, but if you view this largely in terms of, of military priorities, you're likely to make all sorts of mistakes. And that I think we should build leverage towards the eventual goal of a regional de-escalation. Or otherwise, uh, the entire region is going to remain in flames. And a lot of the problems that we're trying to solve, whether it be Iran's action in ungoverned spaces or, frankly, actions by jihadist groups like al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, will not be addressed. And let me just give you a specific example. So I'm all for us pushing back against Iran's support for Houthi militants in Yemen through sharing more intelligence, uh, 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 providing more support to interdict flows of conventional arms uh, to the Houthis, especially things like anti-ship cruise missiles, which could uh, uh, frustrate traffic through the Bab al-Mandab, and uh, I'm all for that. But you might have seen that there was a recent report in the news about us considering significant support for a UAE offensive uh, to liberate the port of Udeida uh, on the Red Sea. Uh, if that is done in the wrong way, it could precipitate a famine uh, that could kill millions of people. Uh, and uh, so, if you, so if you're going to do it, 
You better do it with your eyes wide open. Make sure that you can open, not only keep the port open, but think about how when the front line gets pushed back beyond the port, how you're going to get food into a population which is on the brink of starvation through the rest of Yemen. And whatever leverage you are by, uh, trying to get by seizing this key Red Sea port, toward what diplomatic end? What's your power, what's your, uh, your, you know, your strategy to get Hadi and the Saudis and the Emiratis to agree to a power sharing arrangement and use that leverage with the Houthis and the Iranians to get them to agree? What is the strategy? If the strategy is just, we want to push back against Iran and show our love for the Emirates, that's not a strategy. And reassurance is not, an in, is not an, a goal in and of itself. Reassurance is a means to an end uh, of advancing our interests and our allies' interests. And, our, and I don't think it's in any of our interests to see the war in Yemen escalate and millions of people die and it be our fault. Uh, that's not uh, in our interests. And I think we can make similar arguments about Syria and Iraq uh, if you're interested. I do worry about a, that if, you know, I think there's a general sense that uh, among many in the administration that the Obama administration was basically feckless. They were too accommodating to uh, the Iranians, that the nuclear deal was seen as the only important thing, and nobody wanted to rock the boat on the nuclear deal. And so we gave kind of the Iranians a free pass on their hegemonic ambitions in the region. And now, you know, the alpha males are back. Uh, there's a new sheriff in town, and we're going to show the Iranians we really uh, mean business. And I worry that if you couple that with kind of rhetoric about putting them on notice and the Iranians playing with fire, and they're going to see what we do, but we're not going to talk to them uh, and have any dialogue, that you're setting yourself up for precisely the scenarios of miscalculation that General Brown warned about. And I will ask you this, uh, people in, in the audience. You remember back in mid-January when we had those sailors drift into uh, Iranian waters and they were captured and they were returned in 24 hours without a shot fired because we had open channels of conversation with the Iranians. Raise your hands if you think that that would be how it plays out again if this happened tomorrow or next week. I think the probability that we would have a war with Iran is very high uh, in that scenario in this administration because they are not talking to the Iranians. They, uh, if you have a pure policy of uh, hostility, that is not a deterrence posture. That is a confrontation posture. Deterrence allows, requires you to give the other side a way out, a face-saving way out, and it requires dialogue. Look up the doctrine. So uh, you have to have both sides of that equation. Maybe we overcorrected in one direction, but I worry that the new administration is overcorrecting in the opposite direction. And that brings me to one point that I worry about very much, which is it's it's obviously clear uh, that the Trump administration priority, prioritizes defeating the Islamic State uh, as the number one objective in the region. We have, on any given day, 6,000 plus forces in Iraq uh, in the counter-ISIS mission, and we now have about 1,000 forces in northern Syria. In Iraq, there are 100,000 Shia militia, about 30% of which are wholly owned subsidiaries of the Revolutionary Guard Quds Force, and they have not targeted the Americans once uh, in the two and a half years of the ISIS campaign. Contrast that to the, period, the last period uh, we had when we had numbers of forces there in the drawdown in 2011, where almost all the casualties we took in 2011 were from rocket fire, especially these large IRAMs that Shia militia were firing at us. And I recall in the summer of 2011, when we were talking about how could we respond against these Shia militia attacks, there were basically two approaches. One was that we launched Tomahawk missiles into Iranian training camps uh, to show the Revolutionary Guard that we mean business. And the other was that we allow our special operations forces to defend our forces inside uh, uh, Iraq, and that, but that was in the context where we had 50,000 guys. We don't have that inside Iraq option. If you want to set 5,000 or 6,000 of our forces against 100,000 Shia militia, there are going to be a lot of dead Americans. And so if you get into a situation where you have escalation with Iran in Yemen or Syria or elsewhere, and they decide to lift the restraints, Qasem Soleimani decides to lift the restraints on attacking our forces inside Iraq, and we start having dead Americans inside Iraq from Kateb Hezbollah or Sabal al Haq or other organizations, there will be a strong degree of political and military pressure to ratchet and escalate in a way that directly includes strikes uh, against Iran. And that's just a, that's, I don't think that's an implausible scenario. So this is all to say, let's try to keep the nuclear deal on track and let's try to put pressure on Iran in a way that's calibrated and informed by a broader political strategy and a goal towards de-escalating a, a region that is way over-escalated uh, uh, in almost every theater that you uh, can uh, imagine. Thanks, Colin. Um, so to, to pull the thread a little bit on the dynamics in the counter-ISIS campaign and what is happening in Syria and Iraq as Iran has this formidable expeditionary force there, um, you know, there, there are some short-term objectives in the counter-ISIS campaign. 
that could push the uh, Americans in the direction of thinking of Iran at least um, indirectly as having similar short-term objectives and pushing back against ISIS. But clearly over the long term, we're at, at loggerheads. Could you talk a little bit about the tensions between those short-term and long-term objectives for the U.S. And, and how we navigate those? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think General Brown was right when he suggested that the natural equilibrium will probably be for us to settle into a more competitive context with Iran. I wouldn't use the term confrontational because I think that risks a self-fulfilling prophecy, but that we are likely to settle post-Mosul, post-Raqqa into a more competitive uh, situation in both uh, Iraq and Syria. But look, Western Mosul is, un is under siege. I would expect that Western Mosul is going to be liberated in the next month or so, um, uh, inshallah. Uh, but after that, you're likely to see fights further to the west in places like Talafar. Uh, and there, you're going to have situations in which our interests and the interests of the Shia popular mobilization forces are going to be at odds, especially because Qasem Soleimani would like nothing better than to establish a land bridge uh, between Iran and uh, northeastern Syria. And, you, and you're much more likely to cut that land bridge through Nineveh province than through Anbar province, although they might try to do both. But you're going to likely to see a situation in which uh, you know, Shia PMF potentially move on Talafar or other areas, and that sparks conflicts uh, with the Peshmerga potentially, or with the Turks uh, coming in uh, from their bases in northern uh, Iraq, and us being caught in the middle of that uh, particular circular firing squad. So um, I think that that's uh, going to be a, a near-term uh, challenge. I think the other, the, the medium-term challenge will be post the post the end of the caliphate. I, ISIL is going to go back to being, or ISIS is going to go back to being uh, an insurgency and a terrorist organization. But once the caliphate is smashed, which it will be, uh, uh, because of the campaign that's uh, that's underway, um, I think a lot of these questions, these sectarian questions, will reemerge in Iraq, and you'll have fundamental questions about how do you demobilize and reintegrate elements of the Shia militia so that you don't get the equivalent of Lebanese Hezbollah, a permanent parallel institution inside Iraq that basically dominates the state. I think that's a, a medium term uh, 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 big challenge uh, to, the, to the Iraqis. On the Syria side of the equation, um, I think that uh, you know, largely what our, con what our posture toward the Iranians depends wholly on what approach to diplomacy uh, the, uh, the Trump administration takes in Syria. I think they've made it clear in the last 24 hours what was already clear, which is they're not going to push for Assad to go. You saw Tillerson say that in Turkey. You saw Nikki Haley uh, uh, say that as well. They're going to push the question of Assad to the side. Um, they're going to focus predominantly on uh, the Islamic State and uh, al-Qaeda's affiliate uh, in Syria. Uh, but the question is, do they lean into some political or diplomatic framework that essentially takes, in my view, and I have an article I wrote in the last couple of days in foreign policy on this, you essentially take the fact that Syria is broken up into six zones that are dominated by different local actors with different external patrons, and you try to lock that in as a, as a framework for an enduring national ceasefire, and then pivot off that to a political arrangement that maybe keeps Assad in power for some period of time, but diffuses and decentralizes power away from Damascus in a way that gets the opposition on board. That is not a great outcome, and it might, basically, and it might not work, but there's no scenario in which this administration is going to push Assad uh, out. And so the question is, if you try to, even if you're not going to have a permanent political settlement, even if you just want to de-escalate the situation in Syria, you can't do that without talking to the Iranians. The Iranians have their tentacles so deep into Syria with Hezbollah, the Shia militia, their ties to the Assad regime. I worry that there may be some in the Trump administration that have this view that basically we can work with the Russians, the Turks, and the Saudis and basically say, look, we'll keep Assad in power and we'll protect our interests in other ways, and the only price for us to do that is you kick Iran and Hezbollah out of Syria, which sounds great, except that it won't work. Uh, and so uh, if, you, if you take a, a pure confrontational approach towards the Iranians inside Syria, it won't work, and it could backfire in all sorts of ways that are counterproductive for our interests. So again, you have to talk to the Iranians, at the very least in the, in the context of a multilateral uh, framework. And I'm just not convinced that the same folks who want to put them on notice and tell them that they're playing with fire uh, are willing to have those adult conversations with Iran. Colin, just one more question for you, and then I do want to bring Mike into the conversation. The Trump administration has not yet acted to rescind the, the JCPOA, but even so, do you believe there are risks to the agreement if the United States adopts a harder line position on Iran policy? And is it, are there possibilities to create opportunities to strengthen the deal itself? And if so, how? Yeah, I mean, you know, 
Trump has called the Iran deal the worst deal ever, along with TPP, which was the worst deal ever, and NAFTA, which was the worst deal ever, and letting China into the WTO, which was the worst deal ever. There are a lot of worst deals ever. Uh, but uh, I don't actually think that in this context he's likely to tear up the deal. Um, my experience is that most administrations don't try to manufacture crises they don't have to deal with. Um, I think the bigger risk of the deal is, is um, that you have, in an essence, over-enforcement um, uh, that uh, reads into the ambiguities of the deal certain things that at, actually end up adding things to the deal. You know, Laterally, one of the concerns I have with the Corker Menendez legislation uh, that's brewing in the Senate, for example, is that it appears to produce new conditions for lifting the sanctions eight years from now uh, uh, at transition day on the deal, and that could be misinterpreted by the Iranians and our P5 plus one partners in ways that undermine uh, the deal. But I'm more worried actually about the deal suffering becoming collateral damage to escalation outside the four corners of the deal. That is, that if you start to get into too big of a fight in a place like Yemen or in Iraq or Syria, we start sinking their ships, they start killing our soldiers, uh, that the deal won't survive that. Uh, that, the, that the political pressure will grow to either scrap it or it just will become unsustainable. I think something to watch uh, for those uh, you know, in the media and others, I think that there is a, that, that there is no question that the center of gravity in the Trump administration is to the right of where the Obama administration is on Iran. They, they are, they're, much, they're more hawkish on Iran. That's true of people like Secretary Mattis and others, and maybe that's the right thing. But I do think that there's a meaningful divide between what I would call the realists uh, within the Trump administration and the confrontationalists. I think the realists basically want to get harder edged with Iran and support our allies more, but do it in a calibrated fashion that understands that we can't overcrank or we risk a confrontation that we don't want, and General Brown uh, was clear on that. I do, though, think that there is a minority within the administration to include some in the West Wing who take a much more confrontationalist approach uh, to Iran and actually want to bait the Iranians into a conflict or generate a combination of economic and military pressure to bring the regime to its knees. Uh, and that aligns much more with, say, that, I think that the, the parallel would be the difference between how, say, organizations like the IDF and Mossad think about Iran, which is more in that realist camp, and how Bibi Netanyahu thinks about uh, Iran, which is more in that regime change confrontationalist camp. And I think that, those, that, there, that there are those camps within the Trump administration, and I just hope that the realists win that argument. Great. Thanks so much, Colin. Mike, you have considerable time at the NSC uh, as well and a longtime observer of Iran and, and the region. If you were advising this president, what priorities w would you articulate for Iran policy? Sure. Well, um, let me say, first of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and congratulations on the report. I thought it was an excellent report. Um, and uh, my, my hope is that uh, folks in government will read it and, uh, and take the advice. Uh, I, I think, you know, look, I, I became Iran director on the NSC staff in 2005. And uh, at that time, the person I was taking over from was not director for Iran. They were director for Iran, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, and Jordan. And you had at the State Department one and a half Iran desk officers, right? So <laughs> we, we actually were in a period where we were just really starting to kind of ramp up our efforts uh, on the Iran question, especially the Iran nuclear question, but, but not only the Iran nuclear question. Because at that time, we were very focused on this uh, matter of countering Iran in the region, especially in Iraq. Um, and that effort, I would say, in terms of the bureaucratic resources we poured into it, sort of mounted steadily over time to the point where you have, you know, like 40 Iran desk officers uh, now or something. That may be an exaggeration. Uh, and you have an Iran watcher in you know, Canada and in the Bahamas and places like this. Um, that's, a, that's a joke. I don't think we actually have Iran watchers there. Until we cut um, the budget 30%. <laughs> so, so, so there's this sort of tremendous increase in resourcing. Um, and I think when you had the Obama administration come in, you saw kind of similar dynamics take place where the Iraq issue suddenly sort of shrank a bit in terms of the bureaucratic resources we paid to it. Uh, and Iran increased you know, even further, as I alluded to. And now I think the danger is, you know, the, the, the U.S. government tends to do this, you know, sort of it's like squeezing a balloon and sort of, you know, different parts grow, other parts shrink. The danger is that if defeating ISIS is really the priority and the kind of thing which we focus our resources on, no matter what we say our Iran policy is, no matter all the kind of, you know, all these sort of fine ideas that we put out there, uh, if we under-resource it and we're just not paying enough attention, um, things can slip sort of out of our grasp in a sense. Um, and this, this is because even though we are sort of tremendously capable, we're not infinitely capable. So ISR resources, for example, they're limited. Uh, and you can either put them over sort of, you know, ISIS or you can put them over Iran. Uh, and you can't always do both. And so there are these difficult trade-offs to make. 
Um, and one of the ways I think you manage those trade-offs is not just in terms of the overall amount of resources, it's in the structure of the bureaucracy. And this is, uh, I know, the most scintillating topic for people here, so I'm going to spend a lot of time on it now. Um, what I mean by that is you have to understand that these pieces all fit together in the Middle East, that countering ISIS and countering Iran are not, in fact, two totally separate policies. Uh, it'd be like saying that sort of shoring up NATO and countering Russia are sort of two separate groups of people doing separate things. That, that can't be that way, and it can't be that way in the Middle East either. And so our tendency to sort of split these things into separate bureaucracies, you know, with an envoy for this and an envoy for that, I think we need to restrain that first and foremost. There needs to be some kind of unification of our efforts uh, and a sort of sensible allocation of resources across the different priorities. Uh, and that, frankly, although it sounds very basic, is, I think, something we've struggled with the most. And that's the key ingredient, I think, for sensible policy and strategy. Um, another key ingredient for sensible policy and strategy is understanding the adversary uh, and being able to put yourself in that adversary's shoes and sort of see the world and the, their, that adversary's interests as they see them. Um, and to be realistic and clear-eyed about that. So one of the, again, one of the difficulties, difficulties we can run into with these strategies of deterrence and so forth is that you could substitute Russia for Iran or you could substitute North Korea for Iran or something like that and the strategy would still read just fine, right? Because um, we sometimes have a tendency to do that. We have sort of, um, uh, this is not a comment on your strategy, Melissa. Um, we have sort of boilerplate approaches to these types of problems, um, which don't necessarily take into account the sort of uh, realities on the ground and, and the nuances of them. My, my own view is that uh, Iran is a, is a really tough challenge uh, for a few reasons. Number one, I think Iran is anti-American, and that's not a sort of recent flirtation. This is an ideological pillar of the regime, and so being nicer to them isn't going to change it. Um, <laughs> even those who are within the regime that are arguing for a more pragmatic or moderate direction are, are still dedicated to regime survival and to some of the basic tenets of the regime. Um, these are not folks who want to sort of overthrow the existing system and replace it with democracy. Um, Iran is, I think, as John alluded to, sort of striving for something that looks like regional hegemony, or at least regional preeminence, let's say. This also is enduring. It's not a recent sort of, uh, it's not a recent phenomenon. And any subsequent regime in Iran, you know, if suddenly tomorrow there were a democracy to break out in Iran, I think they would still want regional preeminence because it's very deeply rooted. And then the way that they pursue these objectives is not through the sort of conventional uh, projection of power. It's through asymmetric power. It's through what I think General Brown rightly noted is sort of gray zone or hybrid warfare similar perhaps to what we see with the Russians in Eastern Europe, um, although with very different sort of mix of capabilities and a different sort of geopolitical landscape that they're dealing with. And those capabilities are apt to grow over time, not shrink over time, in part because of recent events. And, you know, the JCPOA um, has lifted a lot of sanctions on Iran. It will also open up in the next five to eight years the possibility of things like conventional arms sales to Iran by Russia and China, uh, missile cooperation with Iran by Russia and China and others as well. So that part of the challenge will grow. So to me, that's all the baseline. You have to, you have to get sort of our side right first, and you have to understand their side before you're ever going to come up with a strategy that's going to work. Um, and then I think you need to have objectives. And again, that sounds utterly simplistic, but it's not usually how we start our Iran policy. Usually we start with tactics. Um, let's engage. Let's not engage. Uh, let's um, say, you know, no boots on the ground or, you know, that's more Syria and Iraq. But we tend to start with tactics because tactics are sort of uh, often very easy to sort of, you know, grasp and, and you're always looking for that, what, those one or two things that will sort of turn things around for you. There never are one or two things that will turn things around for you on foreign policy because successful foreign policy strategies are really about using all the tools sort of in concert with one another and it's the orchestration yeah. that really makes it work. Uh, and not sort of, well, we're going to do this or we're going to do that. Um, so so what, what are the objectives, ultimately? I, I think the objectives are we don't want them to make meaningful advances in their nuclear weapons uh, program. Um, it's not just that we don't want them to get a nuclear weapon. It's that we do, really don't want them to get any closer than they are today, and we'd like them to go backwards, uh, if possible, but that's pretty hard, I think. Um, second, uh, and we don't want them to share that technology either, by the way. Um, second. Uh, we want to uh, ensure that uh, Iran is not challenging American interests in the region. Iran is not undermining American allies in the region, um, and so forth. And then third, I think we want to stop Iran from mounting cyber attacks, terrorist attacks, uh, and the like globally, not just uh, within the region. 
For, for that, I think you need a strategy of deterrence, ultimately. And I think that's something that your report articulates, and I think something that both John and uh, Colin have, have talked about. And to me, a strategy of deterrence uh, ultimately has three pillars. Um, one is focused on the JCPOA. And, and here, I think, actually, you now have a bipartisan consensus, ironically enough, because this was very contentious in 2015. But now that the deal is in place, uh, I think actually you people are being very sensible in Washington and saying, look, whatever, dis whatever debate we had in 2015, the reality in 2017 is that this deal is in place. Um, it is accepted sort of the world over. And our leverage will be greater um, sort of coming in and saying, here's what you need to do, allies, to keep us in it, than by tearing it up and then trying to convince them of some new strategy. Um, and in, um, in what I've written, and I think also in, in your report, Melissa, uh, there are, I think, various things we can do that are articulated to strengthen its enforcement, but also very critically to fix the holes in it. Because my view isn't now that, well, you know, gosh, the Obama administration was right. I would never say that, God forbid, um, that this is a great agreement. My view is, look, it does have flaws. And the, now the question is really, how do we address those flaws, um, given the realities of today? And these are flaws like the fact that it doesn't include anything about Iran's missile program, the sunset in 10 to 15 years. And there needs to now be serious thinking about how are we going to address those flaws um, without making everything worse. <laughs> um, the second objective, I think, has to be to deter Iran in, in, in terms of its, again, challenges to American interests in the region, to counter Iran in the region, as we say. And a lot of people say that. And the, the question always is, well, what does that actually mean? What are you really willing to do that you're not doing now? Um, and, and I think there's a whole range of things that we can do. Um, I've written about them. Others here have written about them. Uh, and it's not, again, one or two big things. It's a whole range of things that you're doing sort of in concert to convince the Iranians that whenever they challenge American interests or whenever they try to undermine an American ally, there'll be a cost imposed. And it'll be a steep cost. It won't be, it won't be an incremental or marginal thing. Because what you want, of course, is for them to never do it in the first place, to think twice, to affect that calculus. You're not going to affect the overall approach that they're taking to the region, to their strategy, to their foreign policy. They're not gonna transform Iran, but you can make them think twice about discrete actions, I think. The third pillar, I think, is strengthening our regional allies. And, and here, I think, our vision needs to be that these regional allies are sufficiently capable and sufficiently linked up multilaterally to sort of address this challenge that Iran poses on their own. Um, and, and so the multilateral piece, I think, has to be one principle of our engagement defensively uh, in the region. It can't just be, let's sort of uh, strengthen the capabilities of the UAE, let's strengthen the capabilities of Saudi Arabia all separately from one another. That's essentially what we've been doing for a very long time. Um, it's let's see if we can't, in the Middle East, um, have some kind of security architecture. The second principle, I think, and others have mentioned this, is it has to be, I think, keyed to the actual challenges they face. So the actual challenges that Iran poses, of course, are not fleets of uh, advanced fighter aircraft, um, not a sort of uh, blue water navy or even a sort of uh, littoral navy that's, that's really able to challenge the capabilities that these guys have. The, the Emirati Air Force, I think, would defeat the Iranian Air Force in less than a day, probably. That's not the challenge. The challenge is things like proxy warfare, political subversion, and so forth. Again, not dissimilar from what we see in Eastern Europe with the Russians, um, except without, again, that massive sort of conventional capability behind it. Um, and that's going to entail a lot of things. It's going to entail sort of coordination among them. It's going to entail investments uh, in terms of training and capabilities from the United States, which takes money, of course, uh, that we need to be willing to spend. Um, and then it also takes actions by those partners to do things, for example, like develop their own sort of resilient political institutions, to embrace those elements of their population that could otherwise um, be susceptible to sort of Iranian influence, for example, to um, reach out to Iraq instead of isolating Iraq and making it part of that multilateral alliance. So there's a whole range of things under that sort of pillar. And, and they all have to go together. And, and I think that's the key point, is that we have to have uh, the resources, we have to have the right structure, and then we have to have a strategy where you have a lot of things moving in concert together. Thanks, Mike. Great overview. Very, very helpful and multinodal. Um, I wanted to, to circle back both with Mike and Colin on, um, Colin raised the, the recent uh, proposed Corker-Menendez legislation um, that, that is getting a lot of momentum 
on the Hill. And you know, there's, there's a different dynamic, of course, uh, in, in this administration with this Congress, uh, both Republican-led. Um, and so it's a different dynamic than we saw in the Obama administration, where you had a bit of good cop, bad cop, when it came to Iran policy. Um, again, if you were both sitting on the executive branch side and thinking through the relationship with Congress and how to leverage both instruments of power and to send signaling and coordinate uh, a policy together, um, what, what sort of posture would you take? What sort of outreach would you be doing to the Hill? Well, I, look, I think that um, to me, the, the Corker Menendez bill is encouraging because it does represent a bipartisan effort. There are a lot of them, Democrats and a lot of Republicans signed up to it. And I think that it's intentionally designed to complement rather than sort of obstruct sort of the, the executive branch carrying out a sensible Iran strategy. That all is good. That is actually what, as you said, Melissa, we um, I think had for a long time before the very acrimonious debate over the JCPOA itself. Um, look, there's, there's no doubt that it can be very useful for the executive branch um, that Congress is applying pressure because I think it allows the executive branch, it allows our diplomats to go out and say, um, look, this, this deal uh, you know, is um, unpopular at home, we're getting this pressure, um, it's not just a sort of policy decision that we're making, but we're a democracy and we have to bear in mind um, that this is a priority for Congress, it's a priority perhaps for the public as well. Um, but you want then enough sort of running room from Congress where you can then go out and actually carry out a diplomatic strategy, as is, of course, the prerogative of the executive branch. So you want national security waivers and so forth. Because I agree very much with uh, something Colin said, which is that ultimately the success of our pressure, and even of sanctions, uh, is uh, going to depend on the extent to which they are multilateral. Um, during the 2000s, when we were for first putting together the, the sort of strategy against Iran and the P5 plus one, um, there, was, there, were, there were sort of complementary interlocking pieces to it. And the UN Security Council sanctions were an incredibly important piece of it, even though by themselves, they weren't nearly enough to sort of uh, really pressure the Iranian economy. Uh, but what they did was they gave us that international unity. Um, it was first and foremost sort of symbolic to show the Iranians there was an international front against them. And then second, actually enabled a lot of countries who need some kind of international sort of umbrella for their bilateral sanctions mm -hmm. to take a lot of actions that maybe the otherwise would have been reluctant to take. And so sanctions diplomacy um, is, I think, to me, the most criti critical aspect of the sort of impact or effectiveness of sanctions. So, so you need both. You need the authorities. Mm -hmm. You need perhaps that useful pressure uh, that comes from Congress and comes from the public. Um, but then you also need the ability to go out and carry out that diplomacy in conjunction with allies. So yeah, a couple things. Let me be a, uh, a little bit more uh, explicit on the on the Corker Menendez bill. I think there are lots of good things about it, and I think it was and it's a good faith effort by a lot of people in Congress to do something that has sharper elbows with Iran without being on its face uh, non-compliant with the JCPOA. I do think there are at least three elements of the bill that are worth much closer scrutiny than they've gotten. I think um, basically, um, I don't have the bill in front of me, but. If my memory serves, sections four, five, and eight of the bill, I think, are the most problematic. Section four is the one about ballistic missiles. And the problem there is how overly broad the, uh, the sectors or the contributions to the ballistic missile program that could be sanctionable are. And there's a real uh, risk that this could, this could go, uh, it could be so overly broad that it could, it could complicate the execution of, say, the procurement channel uh, that's part of the JCPOA. Or it could run sideways from European uh, interests in a way that splits the P5 plus one coalition. So I think as staff, and, and members of Congress tweak uh, the legislation, they should make sure that any steps they take on uh, the ballistic missile front aren't so overly broad uh, that uh, it unintentionally runs sideways from, from basically either our explicit commitments are under the deal or the consensus that underlines, uh, underlies the implementation of the deal um, uh, along the lines that Mike suggested. So I think uh, Senator Booker and some others have suggested some uh, new language on, on that section. I, I hope people are looking at that. I think section five of the bill, if I remember, is the IRGC portion. And I think the concern there is that it effectively designates the IRGC as a terrorist organization. And the problem with that is not that the IRGC are good folks and we shouldn't be mean to them. We can already. Uh, designate and sanction uh, any member of the IRGC and the IRGC as an organization under existing authority. So the bill actually does nothing uh, uh, beyond being a symbolic uh, gesture to basically rub it in the nose of the IRGC. Uh, so it's gratuitous. 
uh, and I understand politics and the need uh, uh, you know, to, to show that you're tough on Iran, but in this case, uh, the symbolism could have the inadvertent effect of triggering a response by the IRGC, and if that response by the IRGC is something that actually puts our troops, our men and women in harm's way, it strikes me that's a price that's not worth paying for a symbolic or political uh, uh, thing that won't make any difference uh, to our ability to actually uh, do what we can already do against the IRGC. In areas like this, I get the politics, but politics should not be the reason uh, to, uh, to do it. And then, if, and then section eight of the bill, which I think in some ways is the most problematic as it relates to the JCPOA, um, again, if I've got the sections right, um, the problem there is it puts a new condition on us lifting the sanctions on transition day. For those of you who don't know all the eaches of the agreement, basically eight years after, after the deal goes into effect, we, if, as long as Iran is compliant with their obligations, we are supposed to move to uh, de permanently delist uh, those entities uh, that were on our sanctions. So they're suspended now, but then you lift the sanctions basically at year eight. The problem with the bill is that it, it, it adds a new condition. It says you can't lift those sanctions unless the administration at the time can certify that actors uh, are not engaged in objectionable behavior in non-nuclear areas which is, again, completely unnecessary, because if they're engaged in non-nuclear uh, malicious activity, cyber, terrorism, uh, uh, human rights violations, we can designate them under other authorities. But what it does do, so it doesn't get us anything, but what it does do is it conveys that we are unilaterally renegotiating the terms of the agreement and that we're looking for a way, a loophole, to not lift nuclear-related sanctions by recasting them as non-nuclear sanctions. And I worry that Iran will say, well, screw us, then screw you. Here are all our conditions uh, for us living up to, uh, and they'll start unilaterally re renegotiating the deal. And I, I agree with Mike that the deal is imperfect, that there are problems with uh, you know, when it sunsets and how long it is and what the constraints are, and there are things that are outside the four corners of the deal. But you don't solve that problem by putting unilateral conditions and unilaterally renegotiating the terms uh, that we're negotiating the deal. You solve that by actually sitting with our European allies, the, uh, the uh, plus uh, you know, the Brits, the French, the Germans, the EU, plus the Chinese and the Russians and the Iranians uh, and trying to figure out uh, ways to uh, smooth out or clarify the ambiguities and, and make some corrections. So I am very worried about this. I will also say that the difference, somebody mentioned good cop, bad cop. The biggest difference is in the Obama administration, they, you, could, you could almost be assured that they would use the national security waivers if they thought that, that implementing things that Congress did would run sideways from the implementation of the deal. The Trump administration is not going to use those waivers. Uh, and in fact, they may see this as a bipartisan permission slip to be even more assertive. Because in a world where the Trump administration owns the failure of the deal, then they may be restrained in pushing past the boundaries of the deal. In a world where they think they have permission from uh, the Congress on both sides of the aisle to dial up enforcement and other activities against Iran to 11, then suddenly they can say, well, look, it's, it's not us. This, there's a bipartisan consent. Say this to my Democratic friends, you will own this too uh, if you sign up uh, to this and uh, things go sideways. Can, can yeah, I just... I, um, I think John yeah, okay, to sure. In. Go ahead, yeah. John. No, I just, one of the things that I think comes out beautifully in this discussion is the U.S. keeps looking for a way to solve this problem, right? We're trying to solve Iran. Iran has been a problem for decades, and we're trying to find a way to solve it. How do we set up the perfect sanctions, the perfect incentives to fix it? And I think the Iranians are resolved to an enduring confrontation with the United States. They're not trying to fix it. They are looking for ways, if the U.S. puts pressure here, how do we have countervailing pressure? How do we avoid getting steamrolled? They're so convinced that they're locked in permanent animosity. And we're so convinced that this administration is going to fix Iran because the last administration couldn't fix Iran, so we're going to fix Iran, that we end up being so impatient and doing things that probably aren't sustainable, we give the advantage to the Iranians. You know, and I think part of the thing, and I'd be interested in, in, in General Brown's comments, are we thinking about if we, this is going to be long term, as indeed the Cold War with the Soviet Union was, does that change what we do? Does that change our pacing? Does that change our areas of emphasis? Because I'm not convinced that the Iranians have anything like the time frame we have, and I'm also convinced that us having a short term time frame and they're having a long term time frame is an advantage to them and a disadvantage to us. General Brown, would you like to, to comment on that? Yeah, oh, yes, I would. And I, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with John. I mean, part of this is, 
And it, I think uh, it was Colin that mentioned it earlier. And, it, you know, we're focused on the counter ISIS campaign right now. And uh, we have to look kind of long term. And uh, I've talked to our staff here is that we're going to come out the backside of the counter ISIS tunnel here pretty soon. And we've got to be prepared for what, what's on the, on the backside of this. And we do have to look kind of long term. And uh, I, I kind of agree with John that it's kind of a kind of a cold war type of approach that we've got to t take a long look at this because we, we I think we intend to be in the region for an extended period of time. And the Iranians are in the region, so they're not, they're not leaving. And so we, we do have to have a kind of a longer term approach for, for this uh, and, uh, and not look at, uh, you know, kind of I mean, there may be some you know, near term short wins, but we also have to look at it from a longer term aspect. Thank you so much, General. We, uh, since we got started a little bit late, we are going to go maybe five minutes uh, beyond the 1130 hour. I want to allow sufficient time for audience Q&A. Um, we have CSI staff on hand uh, with microphones. Um, and if you could please raise your hand, as many of you are, I will call on you. Please state your name and your affiliation and state your question in the form of a question. Let's start with Barbara Slavin over there. Please. Thanks, Melissa. Barbara Slavin from the Atlantic Council. Congratulations on, on getting the report out. A um, couple things, and this is for General Brown, perhaps if he would reply. Uh, has there been an effort to try to get some sort of mechanism of communication with the Iranians in the Persian Gulf to prevent these uh, incidents that we've seen where the Iranian boats come dangerously close uh, to American ships? If you were to try to negotiate such an agreement who would do the negotiating? Would you need the State Department to do that? Um, it, it just seems that, that this is a potential area of opportunity. And then to the panel, the fact that the Trump administration has been so strong in support uh, of the Saudis and others, uh, do you think this is giving them a little bit more courage to actually deal with the Iranians and begin to negotiate some understandings of, of their own? And is this something the United States should encourage or should we stay out of the way? Thanks. Great. And we're actually going to take a couple of questions just to ensure we get to a good group. The gentleman in the back right there. Thanks. I'm Gene Gerger. I work for Senator Markey. Uh, my question is for Mike. Um, in your comments, you suggested that there actually is not as much of a trade-off between a more confrontational policy towards Iran and the fight against ISIS. And I recall from your uh, testimony at the Foreign Relations hearing the other day that you suppose that because Iran is supporting Assad, Assad's regime is fueling the rise of ISIS, that that trade-off is actually less than others would assume. Um, I think it's pretty easy to imagine how a more confrontational policy towards Iran would hinder the fight against ISIS if both of these countries, the United States and Iran, started directing resources that are otherwise going towards the fight against ISIS towards each other. You could imagine that the fight against ISIS would not progress as quickly as it would otherwise. What I'm curious to know is how do you envision that kind of causal story where um, a more confrontational approach towards Iran actually advances the fight against ISIS? Great. And we'll take one more. Gentleman right here in the yellow sweater. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Vyacheslav Kosarev from Russian Embassy. And I have just one small comment and one uh, small uh, question. A uh, comment is about uh, the statement that Russia complicates things in Syria. And I completely disagree with it. And um, Iran, both Russia and Iran, are present in Syria on a, a legal basis. Uh, and uh, we are fighting terrorist uh, groups uh, in Syria uh, with uh, legitimate, legitimate um, uh, power in Syria. I mean, Assad. Uh, the question is about uh, your uh, recommendations. The first one is um, uh, about GCPOE and uh, it's not renegotiating, but uh, um, closing loopholes. Uh, and uh, there is uh, one notion that uh, you want to clarify guidelines on Iran's nuclear development in the last years of the GCPOE and also about missile de development. Um, and uh, I want to comment on the second part because there is no uh, motion, notion uh, in GCPOE about missile, uh, ballistic missile programs. Uh, so uh, do you want to start a new chapter and how you want 
to make it in a practical way. Uh, but uh, what I think that if we have any problems with the GCPA, they should be discussed within Joint Commission only and uh, not starting a new negotiate process. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, let's start, if General Brown is still on the line, um, we can uh, direct the question about lines of communication in the Gulf uh, with the IRGC provocations that have been going on. Um, if you'd like to take that question, sir. I, I can. And th this has been a discussion, because I, I think we've tried this in the past. We've, we've talked about it here recently. Um, but we also kind of, I think we realize that the, uh, you know, uh, the Iranians' opinion in the United States that uh, they're not probably inclined to accept the fact that if it was a direct, direct uh, U.S. to Iranian. I will tell you that you know there are bridge-to-bridge -bridge communications between our, our ships out on the water, but to, to work at a higher level for, for a uh, to work through a miscalculation, uh, I don't think that that's in the near term. If we were going to do it, it would be Department of State that would probably work that. But I also believe there may be other ways that we do this through some of our other partners, the others that have a, a maybe a better relationship with Iran that can carry a message. Uh, you know, to the uh, to the Iranians to to avoid a miscalculation. So it, it's probably not as uh, you know real time that we could do that. Um, but it probably one of those that you have to work over time to send a message. But uh, you know, we probably you know I, I'll just give you the example that what we're doing with the Russians in Syria. We, we do have a phone line, so we can talk to the Russians real time uh, just for deconfliction, and that has been fairly successful. Great, thank you. And then um, if. It folks want to jump in. I know there was a specific question to Mike on the ISIS-Iran trade-off, if mm -hmm. you want to start with sure. that Sure. Um, well, look, and this maybe addresses part of Barbara's question as well about the relationship between our allies in the region, especially the Gulf states mm -hmm. and Iran. Um, and, and it was mentioned before that you've got this kind of danger of regional escalation. Uh, and of course, we heard from uh, President Obama in the, the last sort of months of his administration, this sense of Iran and the allies need to share somehow or, or come to this balance. Um, look, my view is the, our allies in the region um, know that Iran isn't going anywhere. They've lived next to Iran for a very, very long time. And that requires, therefore, some pragmatism on their part. So, so we see that Iranian uh, pilgrims will be allowed to perform the Hajj this year. Um, we do see dialogue between Iran and uh, the Gulf states. And I think that that will always be the case. But, but I think that it will never really solve, ultimately, um, the current problems we see. because. My own view is that uh, at the root of a lot of the current problems we see are, are two big things. Number one is that Iranian security strategy that I mentioned, which I think is inherently destabilizing. Um, I, I think the way that Iran chooses to pursue its security, the way it chooses to pursue, pursue that regional preeminence in a non-conventional way, uh, proxies and political subversion and so forth, um, as long as that continues, you can't, I think, have uh, any sort of real reconciliation between these states because one thing Iran is trying to do is to, is to destabilize many of these states. Um, second, though, is um, the weakness of the states in the region itself. And when we talk about the Cold War as an analogy with Iran, uh, where, where General Brown uh, was going with one of his previous answers, I think we need to remember that a big part of our success in the Cold War was not anything we did to the Soviets. It was what we helped our allies do. The strength of our allies in places like Western Europe, the strength of our efforts in places like Asia, um, and, and just the success that those allies were able to have relative to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had its own problems, um, but I think the fact that our allies were strong made a big difference. We need to keep that in mind, I think, in the Middle East, because in response to um, the question uh, over here, the um, it, there is this kind of, it, when you read the stories in the media, you almost get the sense that somehow everything was okay in the region, and then in 2014, ISIS emerged and uh, destabilized the situation, right? And by taking Mosul and taking Fallujah, well, I think that's, that's not how it all really transpired, and we all know that, right? There was tremendous uh, instability in Iraq itself and in Syria well before ISIS really sort of emerged in the way it did on the scene, because ISIS was you know, pretty much sort of uh, stifled for a long time uh, before 2014 and slowly came back onto the scene in an environment that was already quite sectarian, quite destabilized. And, and this is really the answer to your question. Iran helps fuel that environment. It does it deliberately, I think. Uh, the Iranians, of course, deny that as you would expect them to, um, just as the Russians will deny um, what uh, they do in places like Eastern Europe. Um, but we don't believe them, and we don't believe the Russians either, I'm sorry. Um, uh, because we see the actions on the ground, we can read our intelligence and so forth. Um, I think that um, that's where countering Iran comes in to say a counter ISIS strategy. I think the folks in our government, whether it's in CENTCOM or in the NSC or elsewhere, are 
fully cognizant of the fact that you can't sustainably defeat ISIS just by liberating Mosul and Raqqa. That unless some semblance of stability can return to those areas, some semblance of governance, um, and you can have some kind of political bargains within those countries, whatever they look like, um, you are going to perhaps see the reemergence of ISIS or something like it, Al-Qaeda and so forth, um, down the road. I think uh, countering Iran is an important part of that process. Um, because they do tend to be in all these places where there is this vacuum. You see jihadist groups, non-state actors, and you do tend to also see Iran and its proxies in these places. So the two things go together. It's not to say that one is the magic solution for the other, and that's why I say good policy in the region has to be orchestrated. A lot of pieces moving together at the same time. But I think ultimately you can't defeat ISIS if you don't address also this uh, threat of Iranian proxy warfare and subversion. So just a, a couple things, Barbara, on your two questions, um, you know, obviously General Brown's the expert on the mill-to-mill -mill channel. I would just say even it's necessary but not sufficient in the sense that you have to have a political channel. The entire reason that we got out of the sailor uh, incident without a shot fired was not because of any channel mill-to-mill. Uh, -mill. It was because Kerry and Zarif could talk to each other on the phone. And so it's, it, will Tillerson uh, be able to do it, or can he delegate to somebody like Tom Shannon or somebody else? But you have to have a sustainable uh, channel to avoid miscalculation and inadvertent escalation. As it relates to uh, the question about does support for the Saudis, the Emiratis, and others actually give them space to, to you know, come to some type of accommodation or de-escalation with Iran, I think that's a really important question. My, the, 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 the point I would make is it's really important for us to reassure our allies, but not at the expense of giving them a blank check to escalate endlessly against Iran. That there needs to be at least implicit strings attached that as we get their, have their back in places like uh, 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 Yemen, that we have an expectation that they are not just going to try to drive to some uh, you know, tactical or, or fearic victory uh, uh, that's military in nature, that they have to have a political strategy and be willing to make concessions, frankly, uh, uh, in the political domain to de-escalate that conflict, or it's an endless uh, loop of humanitarian suffering, terrorism, and expanding rather than contracting Iranian influence. And I've just seen no signs thus far from the Trump administration that they're thinking about that strategy. And that's why I used the Hudeda example from before. It's a humanitarian crisis if you don't have a humanitarian and diplomatic component to what we may or may not do in support of the Emiratis in a place like Hudaydah. As it relates to whether it supports the ISIS campaign, I would just add two things. I agree with almost everything Mike said. I would just add two things. One, in Iraq, any efforts post-Mosul and post-Caliphate to build up Iraqi institutions and deepen the partnership with the United States provides a counterweight to Iran, which is also consistent with preventing Dash 2.0 from reemerging from the rubble of places like Ramadi, Fallujah, uh, and Mosul. So that and that's a place where I think it can be consistent as long as we don't overcrank and become overtly confrontational with Iran inside Iraq. In which case, our presence inside Iraq will become untenable. And that was clear by the dance that Prime Minister Abadi was doing when he was in town, as well as the interactions he had with us at the end of the administration. In Syria, the tensions with uh, Trump's strategy, such that it is, I think, are more acute. Because on the one hand, he's signaling he wants to do more with the Russians on the counterterrorism front, and he's willing to defer the question of Assad, both of those things play into Iran and Hezbollah's interests. Uh, so uh, the, the question there is, um, you know, how do you have a serious strategy that, de that defeats terrorism while trying to box the Iranians out? I don't think you can. I think it requires a long-term political solution, and that requires addressing the Iranians uh, and having a dialogue with them. So until uh, the uh, Trump uh, folks uh, decide they're willing to do that, you're not going to resolve any of the issues uh, inside Syria and sustainably defeat uh, the Islamic State or Al-Qaeda's group. The only two things I would say to my friend from the Russian embassy is, um, with all due respect, 80% of your strikes have been against non-Al-Qaeda and non-Islamic State targets. So if you're fighting terrorism, I'm not sure who the terrorists are that you're fighting. Uh, but nevertheless, and in, as it relates to the uh, ballistic missile issue, I would agree and dis I, I, I basically think you should not try to add ballistic missiles to the JCPOA. You can try to negotiate constraints on Iran's uh, ballistic missile program, good luck. Uh, if you're sitting in Iran, forget what you think about the regime. You see the, what the Israelis have in terms of long range strike, what the Emiratis have, what the uh, uh, Saudis have, the ballistic missiles that they also have in their arsenals, and you don't have a nuclear program, your only means of defense and deterrent should you get attacked 
is the retaliatory capability that comes from conventional missiles. You are never going to bargain those away unless you have significant constraints, I mean, sorry, con significant concessions from the United States on the sanctions front or a multilateral arms control agreement that the Israelis and the Gulfies will never s sign up to. So I think it's a pipe dream if you believe you can renegotiate the JCPOA to involve ballistic missiles. It doesn't mean you can't do sanctions. It doesn't mean you can't do interdictions. It doesn't mean you can't do intelligence cooperation to try to slow their program down. It doesn't mean you can't do ballistic missile defense architecture and all the rest of that stuff, but it is crazy talk. It's fantasy land if you believe that the Iranians are going to negotiate away their ballistic missile program at any cost that we would be willing to pay. I wonder what he really thinks. I know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, we'll take three more. Um, gentlemen here in the front, um, with the, and uh, Steve Hecker right behind him, and let's see. This will be on this side. Um, young man in the back there. Thank you. I'm Peter Humphrey, uh, um, intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. Um, when I talked to Obama administration officials, they all pretty much admitted that uh, they were counting on organic regime change during that 12, 15 year period because otherwise Iran does get a nuclear weapon. And uh, at the same time, there was no support for any organic regime change. There was no covert information operations revealing the hundreds of multi-millionaire mullahs. There was nothing going on. There was no secret committee to think about how to massage regime change. Now, now you know that that North Korean intercontinental ballistic missile engine is going to show up in Iran one of these days. So, so I got to ask the question, you know, where's the secret committee to take a look at regime change while we're waiting for the 12 or 15 year period? Hmm. I think, Colin, you led that committee. <laughs> We're going to group uh, some, some questions. Let's go to Steve next, right behind. Thank you. Hi, Steve from DOD. We haven't heard any discussion yet about the domestic political balance of power in Iran and what impact that has on Iran's um, destabilizing activities, support for terrorism, all the big issues that our policymakers care about. So my question to you is about Rouhani, who's up for re-election in about six weeks. Do you think it matters? Uh, does Rouhani have the will and capability to change Iran's behaviors in ways that are favorable towards our interest? And if you think that is, that is the case, how do we shape policy so we empower Rouhani and not weaken him against the hardliners? Right over here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Andrew. I'm a sophomore at George Washington University. Um, I was wondering, because we're talking about you know, the regional dynamic and allying against Iran with, with local partners. Um, if you think that's going to force a more belligerent uh, administration to rekindle our relationship with Azerbaijan and uh, coordinate uh, with its, uh, the northern allies of Iran against Tehran, um, as they haven't had kind relations in the past. Great. Um, change? Yeah, I'll just do the Obama question. So, I mean, with due respect, I have no doubt you've talked to some people uh, who were in the Obama administration. Um, I was in every Situation Room meeting on Iran for the last two and a half years of the administration in the context of the Iran deal. And I sat in the Oval Office every single morning with President Obama for the Presidential Daily Brief where we talked about Iran's strategy. You're just wrong. Uh, I, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't say that some people didn't say that to you, but there was zero uh, uh, there was zero assumption uh, that the president made uh, that the Iran deal only made sense in the context of uh, moderation of Iran's policy or regime change. There just was zero. Did we hope that 10 or 15 years would buy time for a gradual moderation of Iranian behavior and maybe a, a, a peaceful regime change? Sure, but the president was explicit to all of his uh, senior staff uh, and in public that the deal had to make sense even if the regime stayed exactly as odious as it was. And if not, he wasn't going to sign on to it. So your interpretation is just counterfactual uh, uh, relative to my direct experience uh, with this. And in, in this context, I would say, look, is there some prospect that Iran moderates? Maybe. Would I, would I call it above 50%? No. Uh, you know, I think su the Supreme Leader is not likely to be alive two years from now, but whoever replaces him is likely to be probably in the same, uh, cut from the same cloth. Rouhani might win, but he's going to be, he could be a relatively weak president, not capable of radically altering their, Iran's foreign policy, which anyway is controlled by the Revolutionary Guard and the Quds Force more than Zarif or Rouhani on anything that doesn't have to do with the nuclear file. So I wouldn't bet on a uh, peaceful regime change, which is why we did not bet on peaceful regime change as a reason for the deal. And the last point I would make is, if you believe that this regime is likely to be just as odi odious, just as committed to a nuclear weapon, just as committed to uh, Israel's destruction, just as threatening to our interests, just as threatening uh, to the Gulfies, 
that a president of the United States in 2030 or a prime minister of Israel in 2030 will have every option that Barack Obama had on the table in 2014 and more because nothing over the decade of, uh, of the agreement or the 15 years of the significant constraints on uh, their stockpile, nothing constrains our capabilities. Our military capabilities will grow, our cyber capabilities will grow, and our intelligence of their program will grow exponentially as a consequence of the nature of the verification regime. So I would much rather be a president of the United States contemplating a military strike on Iran's nuclear program in 2030 than I would have wanted to be that President Obama contemplating that in 2013, 2014, or 2015. So one does not have to assume that you get this kumbaya outcome with the Iranians to presume that we will not be worse off as a consequence of, this, of the deal, even in a world where this regime stays just as bad as it is today. Mike, do you want to quickly come back on that? Yeah, just so I want to talk about this very last point that Colin made, because I think it's actually a very important one to think about uh, as we project forward uh, our Iran strategy. I think here I, I actually disagree somewhat because I think that what we are more likely to see over the next 10 to 15 years of this JCPOA, if it holds together, which is I think a big if, um, is the deal will allow Iran uh, to build up its conventional strength. I don't know they'll do that because they may decide that's actually not the right allocation of their resources. It will allow Iran to get missile help from other states after eight years under the JCPOA. Um, there still may be constraints on that. For example, we'll still have sanctions presumably on North Korea when you're talking about that engine, for example, we'd still try to stop that. Um, but if Iran eventually wants, for example, an ICBM, which is I think far away with the Iranians at this stage, um, I think they would need international help and, the, and I think they'd be allowed to do that under the, the deal. The, the other element is what else will change in the region? Because I think that we're already seeing some connections between Russia, uh, China, and Iran. And I think that that may change the sort of operating assumption um, that has, I think, under, underlain quite a bit of our strategy in the Middle East for a long, long time until the Russian intervention in Syria, which is that we'd have essentially uncontested freedom of action in the region. I mean, imagine if you did have Russian forces using Iranian bases as the Russians and Iranians have, you know, supposedly, according to the media, just agreed. Imagine if you had, um, you know, Chinese naval vessels docked at Iranian ports and so forth. It does change the landscape somewhat, which is why I think as you project forward, you have to at least assume that those things will happen uh, and come up with strategies, not just for yourself, but for your allies, that take into account that may, maybe an environment that looks more like A2AD uh, and an Iran which maybe is stronger when it comes to some of those capabilities. So, so I think that that will ultimately change. Great. John, did you want to comment on the domestic political dynamics yeah. upcoming election as well as uh, Iran's neighbors to the north and how they might play into a strategy? Um, I'm going to plead ignorance on Iran's neighbors to the north. All of my turf battles at CSIS are about getting rid of turf. And I, I do Iran, but I, I, when you go east or north, I quit. Um, <laughs> I got too much stuff going on. Uh, you only do the easy countries. I only That's do right. easy countries. The 25 easy ones. Um, to get to Steve's point, I, I think that a lot of Americans sort of misjudge Rouhani. Um, I think Rouhani is a nationalist. He has been at the center of national security decision making in Iran for decades and decades. I first saw him in Tehran in 2000 at a conference that the IPIS put on. And what was so striking is all the other Iranian speakers were clearly nervous. And they clearly read prepared texts word for word. And Rouhani came in and he strode in with his flowing robes and the crowd parted and he speculated and he joked, and he was, he was the only Iranian who wasn't looking over his shoulder. And that was in 2000. And I think he's accrued more power. When I've seen him in New York when he comes out for UNGA, I mean, Rouhani speaks with significant confidence. Rouhani is not a friend of the United States. He's not going to be a friend of the United States. He doesn't think anything good is going to come out of the relationship with the United States, I don't think. But does he think that Ahmadinejad made a fundamental strategic mistake by so antagonizing the United States that he rallied the world against Iran? Yes. And should Iran moderate the world's hostility? Absolutely. So I think Iran is a nationalist, a serious conservative, not a conservative in the Iranian sense, but a conservative in preserving the revolution. And the way to preserve the revolution is diminishing the level of tension diminishing some of the regional hostility. He was just talking with the Emir of Kuwait. Quiet things down in order to preserve the system, not in order to moderate the system, not in order to evolve the system, 
to preserve him. I don't think we should be trying to strengthen him. I don't buy the argument that Iranian politics are a battle between conservatives and moderates, and we have to reward the moderates and, and punish the conservatives. I, what we have to do is settle in for the fact that this is going to be a, a difficult country for a very long time. We can't shape their politics, but if they become more predictable, that's a good thing. Not because we're going to be able to fix it, but as Colm was saying, the regional temperature goes down, you reach accommodations. We have reached so many accommodations with the Iranians in Iraq. We could not be doing what we're doing in Iraq without some understanding with the Iranians. And I think they're, preg they're paranoid as hell. But even paranoid people can be pragmatic. And I think that is the, 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 the sort of minimal thing we should be trying to do, not because we can fix it, not because we can, have, we can shape the perfect policy, but we can advance our interests and try to keep them from acting unpredictably to undermine our interests. Can I just have one data point? Sorry, I've talked too much already, but I, I think we do need to caution. I'm all for pushing back against Iran more than uh, you know, perhaps we did in the Obama administration, but we should keep the military balance in perspective. Last year, the Iranians spent about $15 billion on their military. The GCC as a whole spent about $130 billion on their military. The Israelis spent another $30 plus billion on their military, and we spent $600 and something billion uh, on our military. Um, the Iranians are not the 800-pound military guerrilla, and most of what they do in the region doesn't take a lot of money, which is why the sanctions weren't what was holding them back. Their budgets didn't go down as a consequence of the sanctions. Had we not done the JCPOA, every problem that people talk about uh, would have basically manifest anyway. Um, and keep in mind that while the Saudis and Emiratis are sp spending billions to fight the war in Yemen, the Iranians are spending millions to support the Houthis, and the Iranians can do almost everything they do in the region on the cheap because uh, they aren't trying to build anything. They're trying to exploit uh, situations of instability, and to the degree that they build things, simply assist parallel structures that exist outside the state to act as veto, act veto points and spoilers in the system and advance Iranian interests but not own the system. So I think we just need to be, we need to be mindful that we push it back against the Iran that exists, not against this fantasy yeah. of an Iran that's going to be, become a regional military superpower in the way that we think that they're never going to be that. They don't want to be that. They threaten our interests through these other capabilities, uh, and that's what we should be focused on. And, 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 and in their, just to play on that, in their mind, if they can play for a tie against the United States, that's a huge yeah. victory. And if we get stuck in a tie with Iran, that's a huge humiliation. Huge. The, the, uh, huge. huge. If I could just Big say. Just, just one final, and then I do want to go to General Brown, and then we need to wrap. Just, just yep. to chime in on, on what John said, I, I think that in response to Steve's question, what I would say is in deterrence, I think you want to create dilemmas for the adversary as much as you can. Which, and, and I think this actually ends up helping those in Iran, at least in theory, who want to argue for changes in policy, whoever they are. And I, I don't think there's one camp that you can identify for every issue that, that that's going to be. You know, and the dilemma is that we'll apply sort of relentless pressure, we'll, we'll sort of oppose them relentlessly unless they do something, right? Unless they change some policy in the way we're looking for it to change. Um, and I think what you don't want to do is to solve the dilemma for them and say, okay, well, you didn't change, but gosh, you're, you're a nice guy, so let's, you know, kind of take it easy. I don't think that actually helps anyone in Iran who's arguing for change, because then they don't need to change. The other thing you don't want to do, though, is to say, we're going to apply relentless pressure to you no matter what you do. Because then, of course, that's not a dilemma either. That's an easy decision. Then they'll just push back, right? So you want to be in that sort of middle ground where there's a dilemma, then there's a, there's a sort of a door for them to go through. Even if they don't want to go through it, they have no other sort of exit route. Great. Thank you. General Brown, final words? Well, first of all, uh, thanks for uh, allowing me to uh, participate and appreciate the invite. And sorry, I couldn't be there in uh, D.C. But uh, actually, I, I found the uh, the responses from my uh, my panel, the other panel members with me, very uh, enlightening. And uh, I've taken a few notes here of things that we're, we'll be thinking about. Um, and, and to Collins and, and to John's point here, um, uh, you know, the, the Iranians uh, will play for a tie. And when they play for a tie, that is a win. They're not going to be a major military power. Um, but they do things on the cheek, and uh, that's the area where they'll just continue to be kind of a nuisance to us as we try to work our national interests in the uh, in the region. So again, uh, it's been a real pleasure to be here. 
Uh, I think the paper has a lot of great uh, thoughts to it. And uh, uh, again, uh, all my best to uh, the panel members and CSIS. Thanks. Thank you so much, General Brown, and thank you for our terrific panel today helping us unpack Iran's strategy and motivations, its capability development, and challenges for U.S. policy going forward. Thank you all to, for coming today. Thank you.